Correct. <laughs> So that's where I start the book because he makes a claim. He One, that black people love menthol so much. And uh, it's a kind of an overstatement because most black people don't smoke cigarettes at all. Really what he's referring to is the fact that in America, African-Americans who do smoke disproportionately prefer menthol brands over non-menthol brands. But what I found interesting is that I ended up trying to study the question, like, how is it that this particular taste preference came about? Is he right that nobody knows? And it turns out that if you look inside the tobacco archives, it turns out that people do have ideas and theories. And if you were to ask a tobacco executive back in 1960, why do black people love menthol so much? They, would, they wouldn't even understand the question. Because at that time, there was no racial preference for menthols. It was, if anything, understood as like a kind of cigarette that people with health anxieties who were concerned about cancer and were looking for a safe cigarette would go for. And if you look inside the industry archives, which is really how I wrote this book, by looking at how the industry thinks about race and thinks about uh, how you create markets, what you see is the players and the tactics that made menthol into a black themed cigarette. You could see the history of the billboards and where you place the billboards and what messages should be on the billboards. You could see alliances being made with black opinion makers uh, and also studies. I was surprised to see how much they study black psychology to try to understand how to sell menthol cigarettes. You also see by looking inside the archives, the growth of a resistance to this targeted marketing and a move towards banning billboards that brings us in 2022 to the what hopefully and may be the end of the story where the Food and Drug Administration is on the edge of banning menthol cigarettes precisely because of the history that I described. So really quickly, what I want to point out is before 1960, menthols um, in the early decades had nothing to do with race and everything to do with a false health promise uh, that menthols were somehow healthier than other cigarettes. And this image, do you have smoker's throat, gives you a sense of why menthols were seen as appealing. That is, if you were congested or if your regular cigarette was scratching your throat, then turn to menthols. It's really only in the 1960s that Cool and then Salem and other menthol brands start moving aggressively into urban markets. And one of the striking things, if you look inside the industry, is you understand why they were doing that. They were being, they were under a lot of pressure because of um, increasing federal oversight and regulations on their ability to market to youth. And so they were looking for new markets, what one company called looking for poverty markets. Uh, and what one document is really a shocking example of how you make poverty markets. It's a document that is about Black St. Louis in 1967. And it's written by a company that was advising the makers of Camel. And what they were basically saying in this memo is, you have to go to Black St. Louis and you have to figure out who influential people are, what they called kingfish, people who are on the street, maybe you're a bellhop or a barber or a, um, or a numbers runner. These are what they called kingfish. They really studied communities very carefully. And what you wanted to do is to be able to give these people what the company called boast material, by which they meant like free samples to hand out to other people secretively so that it, quote, allows these people to be in the know and brag to friends about inside information. And the most important thing that this memo stressed about camel menthol and the Negro market was that it had to be secretive, that people didn't, couldn't know that this was going on because they, if they felt manipulated, they obviously would make different choices. So this is an image from uh, Newark in the 19, 1980s to show you how prevalent 
these questions about how you put position billboards, what the message of the billboard should say. You know, they studied very carefully um, how people saw these billboards, how many people uh, witnessed them and how people recalled and how it influenced their buying behaviors. So the book is about the shift from marketing menthols as a health cigarette to marketing it as marketing it as an urban cigarette. And then it's also the history of the rise of local activism. Uh, this guy, whose name is Henry McNeil Brown, is actually one of my favorite characters in the book. Um, he uh, was a Chicago, uh, a Chicago um, a professional man who decided that it was not enough just to kind of complain about billboards. What he did is in the dead of night, calling himself Mandrake, he would go around uh, Chicago in the late eight, 1980s, early 1990s, and he would uh, either blackwash or whitewash billboards, especially ones in black neighborhoods that were disproportionately um, prevalent compared to white neighborhoods and were targeting African-American youth primarily. Um, and what's really striking is the people who defended, and so he, his, his tactics were emulated in Philadelphia, New York, Dallas, um, and the kinds of people who objected to this, this vandalism of billboards, were surprising to me. There were people like Benjamin Hooks, the executive director of the NAACP, who saw this as um, a kind of, they, they were partnering very closely with the tobacco industry because in some ways it depended on the industry for financing, much like uh, black publishers did of ebony or black newspapers. And so one of the things I learned is that the forces keeping tobacco and keeping menthol in place in cities were, um, were, were people who we, we thought were kind of fighting for health and civil rights and African-American well-being. Uh, it all came to a head in 1990 around a, the R.J. Reynolds decision that, you know, instead of just implicitly marketing menthols to Black people, they would just come right out with a new brand called Uptown, and they were going to go into Black Philadelphia to test market it as a Blacks-only cigarette, as in, you know, we know Black people smoke menthols. We're just going to go after the Black market by telling them, you know, we just want Black people to smoke this cigarette. And the interesting thing is how the, the people who came out against this were also unlikely. It was like, you know, the um, Lewis Sullivan, who was the D Secretary of Health Human Services under the George Herbert Walker Bush Republican administration, who called out RGR for a sick and sinister campaign. And anyway, part of my point here is that Mandrake started a movement to take aim at the billboards. And over the course of the 1990s, it only grew. And so when, when the departments of um, justice and attorneys generals from multiple states finally took on the tobacco industry at the end of the 1980s, one of the outgrowths of it is the banning of billboards. And so that began the, you might say, the first chapter in what seems to be like the end of the menthol cigarette and the history of targeted marketing. There are no more billboards. Now, uh, Keisha and Summer have asked me to do a very short reading. Uh, and so I thought what I would do is read from the very end of the book, because the end of the book starts, uh, it, it starts with the, the murder of George Floyd, which would seem like an unlikely place, but I'll explain how this is all connected. The title of the conclusion is Death by Deception by Design, The Long Road to I Can't Breathe. In 2020, Menthol smoking collided brutally with police killing and COVID deaths, linked by the resounding cry, I can't breathe. By the time I sat down to write the conclusion, the menthol story of exploitation ending often with the muffled gasps for breath had taken a horrifying set of turns. In mid-2020, tobacco-related deaths in Black America suddenly took on new meaning with the onslaught of the coronavirus pandemic and the murder of George Floyd. Black people seem to be disproportionately victimized. Deep-rooted insults now took their toll. Mr. Floyd was killed by a Minneapolis policeman who held his knee on the black man's neck for over eight minutes, ignoring his pleas, I can't breathe. As the New York Times reported, his death occurred in the waning light 
of the Memorial Day evening outside a corner store known as the best place in town to find menthol cigarettes, pictured here. As Mr. Floyd pleaded for his life, he carried coronavirus, which was taking its own disproportionate toll on black lives. Here was a murderer's row, culprits arrayed as if in a lineup, menthol cigarettes alongside police chokeholds and the coronavirus, all agents depriving black people disproportionately of life and breath. What does it mean that black lives are suffocated in incidents like this played out over different timescales, minutes, weeks, years, and decades? The stories of menthol, coronavirus, and policing reveal different aspects of layered exploitation, discrimination, long-term poverty, and the ills of racial capitalism. And how they are conjoined sheds light on the forces depriving black people of breath. And I'll end with this. The deprivation of breath came slowly, aided by canny deceit in the case of the menthol cigarette. Menthol smokers were never agents of truly free choice. They were subject to relentless nudges, marketing, messaging, and the, the skewing of, choice, of, of choices. Being offered menthols as a safer cigarette or sold menthols as a tool of black self-determination. And what this book does is add historical texture to what tobacco consultants themselves called exploitation. And it shows how these agents worked hard to manipulate the structured circumstances of the truly disadvantaged. But the prevalence of menthol in the city was not preordained. Menthol smoking was never an inherent racial taste preference. The presence of menthol cigarettes at the scene of George Floyd's murder had come about by design. It was no accident. In this book, we see how big tobacco sought out cultivated and protected these quote, poverty markets, unquote. We also see how marketers studied black life and social anxieties, as well as the insecurities of health, identity and status to understand how their products could thrive. Menthol smoking was manufactured by forces intent on profiting from poverty. It was created by outside forces outside cities that successfully capitalized on urban distress, doing so by an elaborate form of predation that I call pushing cool. And I will end there. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Wailu. Thank you, Dr. Wailu. Um, well, again, we do wanna encourage people to enter their questions in the chat, or if you would like to just ask on camera, you can do that too. But we're gonna uh, kind of jumpstart the conversation with some questions of our own. Uh, Keith, what inspired you to write this book and shed light on this issue? Um, and I, I ask that because I think, you know, in light of celebrating Black History Month, particularly this year, the theme is health and wellness. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of focus on, you know, taking care of your health, whether it's self-care, mm -hmm. mental health. And historically, we know that cigarettes are bad for you, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I come from a, a family of, of some smokers, but this has never been a conversation on the marketing of, of, of menthol specifically. So if you can just um, share a little bit with us what... What inspired you to write this story? Yeah, uh, so, you know, I, I would say part of it goes all the way back to growing up in the high point of menthol marketing, right? And just being kind of interested in following the politics of how those billboards came down. But the other is the fact that I, as a historian, I study the history of health and the forces that improve health, but also the forces that, um, that make our health worse. And usually I study medicine or I study public health. I study the history of things like, you know, um, hand washing or access to healthcare or the history of Medicare. 
but those are all like positive developments in the history of health. What I find striking is that even as like many of us talk about how we, how we make health better, how we improve health, the idea that there were there, there are forces at work <laughs> historically that have an interest in selling a product that has a long-term negative influence and impact on health struck me as just mind-blowing, right? And we kind of know that. We sort of know the cigarette is bad for you. So here's the other thing that in, in, inspired me to write this book. In 1998, when the departments of health, uh, justice and other uh, attorneys general sued the industry, you know, what happens in the course of a lawsuit is that there's a discovery process where the industry had to make available all of these internal records. And now you can actually see all those internal records. I can sit at my office and actually just call them up. And what I saw, even before I thought about writing this book, I was just like tooling around in these records. What you saw was not that the history of smoking is like about smokers and what they choose. What you saw is the history of like that memo of the deliberate processes by which menthol brands ended up in black St. Louis. And, and I didn't see just one memo like that. I saw three memos, then I saw 10 memos, then I saw hundreds of memos about you know, how, how structured and purposeful and relentless. So as somebody who's interested in health, I figured I had to write this book to pull back the curtain and show us that you know, the forces that we're up against in um, being committed to health and well-being are pretty extraordinary. And then when I discovered that like the publisher of Ebony Magazine um, was more interested in advertising dollars from the makers of menthols than in calling out the industry for this targeted deception, that blew my mind again. So I'll give you like a good example. In 1960, what, four or five, when Nat King Cole died. Nat King Cole, hero, you know, um, enormously popular figure, black singer, um, who was also a, a big smoker. Um, he advertised Chesterfields, but he smoked menthols. Um, when he died, it was clearly connected with his smoking. And when Ebony Magazine ran after he died, after they covered his battle with cancer. But when he died, they gave a sort of a wonderful biography of him. They didn't mention smoking once at all. And in that same issue, there are four advertisements for four different menthol brands. Cool, Salem, Newport, and Montclair. While at the same time, other industries, other newspapers were calling out the industry for going after different populations. So it's also the history of like the shocking silence of people who you think are, you know, in a position to call out the industry, but didn't. So, you know, that's a long answer to your question about like why it is that people don't know this. One of the reasons why people don't know this or think about it is that it, for most of the most of the time it's been hidden. Um, so when Nat King Cole's um, wife, she actually sued the industry after he died and there was a settlement, but it was kept secret. And so that's why we never know the story unless you look in the archive and you see that there was a settlement. And then the last thing I'll say, it didn't stop the industry four or five years later, thinking about a new menthol brand and inside one of the marketing companies, they said, I know what, why don't we come out with a brand called Coal? Because after all, Nat King Coal is a symbol of coolness and black people will love that idea. And I suspect somewhere in the archives, in the boardrooms, they said, well, you know what? Nack and Cole died of lung cancer. And maybe this isn't such a good idea because we settled with his spouse and I'm not sure we should use his name to market cigarettes. 
So those are the kinds of stories that you can only know if you pull back the curtain and look inside the boardrooms. Um, it's not the kind of story that we knew on, you know, when I was growing up in, um, in the Bronx and Queens in the 1970s. Thank you. As a follow-up to that, um, so once the lawsuit happened and they took down the billboards, did the tobacco industries ever, um, did the tobacco industries ever come out and try to rectify the issue that, or the impact that they've made in the black community? Like, have they done anything to really rectify everything that has happened? Uh, the answer is no. Um, they, you know, in many ways, uh, people criticize the, the lawsuit settlement for letting the industry off easy. Um, what they did have to do is to finance a number of um, initiatives. So, for instance, in the state of California, one of the uh, byproducts has been a really aggressive anti-tobacco smoking campaign. So to the extent that on TV, if you watch te television and you see anti-tobacco ads, many of those are financed through the settlement. That the settlement's agreement required that there be much more um, attention on the, in the public media to anti-smoking or health-related messaging around smoking. Um, but at the same time, what the industry has continued to insist with regard to menthols, what they say is, look, um, yeah, we know, we'll, we'll admit now that tobacco is bad, but menthols don't make cigarettes any worse. And so we shouldn't ban them. That's their argument. The people who argue for banning menthols go, actually, there is good evidence that menthols um, are initiators of smoking, uh, like with flavored cigarettes, and that they're harder to quit. So actually menthols are worse in a number of different ways. Uh, um, I, I should say one last thing, which is that we really are at the cusp of uh, uh, the nation, decide, the FDA deciding on the ban. Uh, they promised to make a final decision by April. And I just wanna point out that um, the, the way in which the tobacco industry has, I, I don't wanna say bought because that's maybe too heavy a thing, but, but I have compromised a lot of black leaders is evident because in 2009, when President Obama signed into legislation uh, for the first time, uh, a law giving the FDA jurisdiction over tobacco products, which is, amazing that it's never happened before. Uh, Congress did in that legislation ban flavored cigarettes. They said flavored cigarettes, nothing good can come of them because all they do is they get young kids started. But the Congressional Black Caucus split on the question of whether menthols, which are flavored cigarettes, should be also included in that. And what they did is they said, well, we don't want to, we, we don't want to do that. Because, and there were some well-placed members of, you know, the Congressional Black Caucus who said, if you put this in, we won't vote for this bill. So what the compromise was that they kicked it to the FDA. And the FDA has been working on this ever since. So that's why we're, you know, 15 years, well, really what, 13 years down the road, and the FDA might be making a final decision on that. But if you ask me, it really should have been done in 2009, right? Because menthols are flavored cigarettes and it's, they should have been banned back then. We have a question from one of our attendees and it reads, are there other health marketing forces at work today that are troubling in the same way that tobacco marketing was? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> the, the, the part of the problem is though, that um, sometimes you really can't see what the thinking is unless you can go inside the industry. But recently we have an example of 
one, and that is the makers of um, painkillers like OxyContin, which have been sued by every state that I can think of from Kentucky to Oklahoma uh, for marketing uh, painkillers that are addictive, that have produced a lot of death and a lot of pain, ironic given the fact that they're painkillers. And, um, and, and it's because of those lawsuits that we can actually see a lot of the same kinds of processes, like working with physicians to encourage the use of painkillers, um, you know, denial about the downsides and emphasis only on the upsides and so on. Some would argue that things like the fast food industry or the soda uh, industry spends a lot of time with these issues as well. Um, and in fact, the, what the tobacco industry would often do is they would say like, well, you know, Sp how, Sprite is really successful at aiming for black consumers. Why blame us for these tactics? And I mean, in some ways they have a point, but actually tobacco products are far deadlier and far more harmful in terms of health. Um, uh, at one point, the makers of Uptown said, well, if Nike could sell you know, sneakers to black kids, like why shouldn't we be doing targeted marketing? And the critics had to point out that sneakers are not like, I don't know anybody who ever died wearing a sneaker, right? But, but you know, cigarettes are a different kind of product. So maybe you should think a little differently about whether that's a good uh, analogy. So the point is, yeah, there's a lot of industries out there. There's a really excellent book that came out um, a couple of years ago last year on the golden arches on McDonald's and how and how they pivoted into this space to kind of become a black franchise, which is the way, um, which is way, the way the makers of cool thought of themselves. Like we have a black franchise and we're gonna fight to protect it. Summer, did you have a question or do you want me to ask? You can ask, it's fine. <laughs> um, I, I think that's that's perfect. Uh, Summer and I came up with some questions beforehand, so um, this is a perfect segue. So we understand that most, if not all, of the cigarette companies took part in this marketing campaign. What efforts have they made to reverse the negative impact that has been made in Black and Brown communities? Um, I wish I had a list. I wish the, the answer was they're doing, you know, these things. Um, I, the truth of the matter is that they are working as hard as they possibly can to hold on to the market, to, to, to hold, the, hold the line against states like Massachusetts banning the sale of menthol cigarettes, cities like San Jose, which recently became the largest city to ban the sale of menthol cigarettes, and the Food and Drug Administration making that determination. And the way they're doing it is in much the same way that they fought other restrictions in the past. And I'm sad to say it's by turning to, instead of them coming out to oppose, turning to people like um, Reverend Al Sharpton, to uh, really go on the road, city after city, um, using his platform to make a different kind of argument. And the argument that they make, and it's not entirely ridiculous, is you know because Eric Garner was strangled, killed by a policeman on the streets of Staten Island while trying to sell loose cigarettes, because African-Americans who smoke are disproportionately uh, smokers of menthols. To ban them uh, is to put black smokers at risk if they choose to buy or bootleg or find other means of buying menthol cigarettes. Now, what that argument misses is that there is nothing in these bans that 
that um, that ban possession of menthol cigarettes. What it says is that establishments cannot sell them, and they cannot be, you know, they can't be sold in New York City. But I think what the industry is doing is they're trying to gin up a set of fears about harm that might come in the wake of a ban. And, you know, a lot of, some of that might be well-founded, but what they're missing is that there's a long history, decades and decades of harm that are, that come from smoking menthol cigarettes. And in some ways I would say, um, you know, menthols are the, menthols aren't the reason why young black men will end up crying, I can't breathe. Menthols, you know, they're, they're not the, they are the reason why people will be crying, I can't breathe, because of the decimation of their lungs over the course of, of years. So, so the industry isn't in the reparations mode. You know, the industry isn't saying, you know, we admit fault and we are ready to make amends. The industry isn't in the mode of saying, you know, mea culpa and, you know, how can we make things better? Uh, they're in the mode of um, still saying that they support black lives. They support black self-determination. Uh, they believe that black people should be allowed to make decisions for themselves. And um, they want to ratchet up fear about what would happen if menthols were banned. Um, it would be great if they were in a reparations mode. And I guess the, the other thing I'd say is, you know, the, the one thing the industry has done since the 1960s is they have, um, they, they've maintained a presence in cities at a time when other industries have left. Now, you know, for, as far as I'm concerned for no good, right? Because they're just interested in what they call poverty markets, but their presence in cities have also been part of like making the cool jazz festivals of the 1980s, you know? And so they've wrapped themselves in the veneer of black pride and black culture. And um, that has worked for them successfully for a long time. And in some ways they're continuing that argument. Um, so that actually leads me into, tonight you spoke about Ebony and how um, uh, companies used people like Ebony to actually market to um, the black community and Ebony and Jet, um, even now Essence, you know, it, it's companies that should have our best interests in mind, um, but they help to promote these negative marketing campaigns. Um, but it makes me think about, I know this might be a stretch, um, Keith, but it really makes me think about the conversations that um, have been had about the Super Bowl halftime show this year, mm -hmm. about how um, NFL worked with Rock Nation and Jay-Z um, in, in order to create a partnership um, to move the needle on social justice issues. Um, but it doesn't seem like it's moving in the line or the direction that it should be. It seems like it's more of a hate to say it, moneymaker for, for certain companies. What are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I don't have a, a lot to say about the Super Bowl in particular, <laughs> but I do think that, you know, this trade-off um, uh, between health and money, it has been a long-standing one. In fact, when Lewis Sullivan took on R.J. Reynolds for the Uptown campaign, he said, you know, this slick and sinister trade-off between health and profits has to stop. Uh, and he came down on the side of health, right? There's another interesting story about um, football in the history of menthol that I pass over very quickly in the book. And that is after Congress banned television and radio ads, partly out of a concern that, you know, this, this was reaching youth and it was by opening the airways this way, and it was a way of enticing young people. So we've had bans before that try to limit who the tobacco industry could reach. One of the things some of the shrewd advertisers for the industry did is they said, you know what? If we put up signs at, at football games and at baseball games, 
then during the coverage of the game on television, they'll see the ads. So there's inside documentation about how they were like, yeah, ban us from TV. We're going to end up on TV anyway. And here's how we're going to get around it. And then so they had to ban ads at football games because the industry was so they're they're incredibly crafty when the billboard era came about because in the wake of the bans on 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 television and radio they said okay we have to go to where the people live and so we're going to go to newark we're going to go to and we're going to start building billboards um and this is a little bit segue from your question, but it just kind of shows you how crafty and, and flexible this industry is. There was one memo that I came across that like took my breath away. Um, they were trying to figure out how to reach black folks in Pittsburgh. And so they, they studied commuter routes from a black area, a neighborhood in Pittsburgh to the downtown. And what they said was, all right, we know that black people travel on this bus, this one line. And so we're gonna advertise black themed menthol on the inside of the bus because it's predominant black ridership. But the buses go through white neighborhoods. So we can't advertise black themed ads on the outside of the bus because that runs the risk of alienating because we don't want to alienate white smokers who might smoke the same product. And, but in a different city, if the bus was going through black neighborhoods, you would put the ads on the outside of the bus and the inside of the bus. This is the level of like detail that they spent, whether it's advertising at football games, baseball games, knowing exactly where cameras were and where viewers were. Anyway, that's not an answer to your question about the Super Bowl in particular, because it's a little bit out of my zone. <laughs> okay, um, I have one more um, question for you. So as a trustee, and I know um, trustee Bob Zuckerman is on the call and, and he had a conversation with you as well, Keith. Um, however, as trustees, we are actually passing a cannabis, um, a retail, uh, I'm sorry, we're passing a cannabis policy within South Orange um, in order to allow for retail sales. And so some of the concerns that I have is the, the negative impact that cannabis had um, before it was legalized on uh, black and brown communities. Do you think that we're gonna see the same negative marketing campaigns that might come out to kind of target certain groups? Um, and should we be looking for that? And what exactly do you think we should be looking for if you believe that they're gonna start doing some sort of negative campaigning? Yeah. So, so this is a very, you know, cannabis legalization is so complicated and it has some connections to the history of tobacco, but, um, but here's where it's a little different. Um, so there is nothing, at, there, there is some utility long before legalization of cannabis to like medical marijuana, right? There, there are, some legitimate reasons why folks uh, would use or dispense marijuana or cannabis for a wide range of health concerns, wasting disease, glaucoma, et cetera. Um, the legalization of cannabis kind of turns the corner though, and it opens up to a wider market. And one of the questions um, I guess you'd have to ask is, you know, to what extent is this market like youth focused? Uh, is it a market that's trying to draw uh, kids in? Um, and that was one of that's one of the concerns with e-cigarettes and vaping, for instance. Uh, and then you'd have to ask questions about the kind of the longer term or the short term health implications of it. Um, so I feel like, you know, the, the problem and the challenge with cannabis is treating it akin to alcohol, treating it akin to uh, other products that are now legalized and where you want kind of a harms reduction approach to thinking about how you contain and control and 
deal with consumption, but it's like consumption trends that we're still trying to get our handle on. And the other thing that's different with cannabis is that it's not one industry. You know, so the, the, the issue with the tobacco industry is th there were, in, it used to be just one, American tobacco was like one monolith uh, in 1910, and it was broken up into five companies. And in some ways, you know, it's still basically five to 10 major, major companies that organized, had a coordinated campaign. So the, the reason why the legalization of cannabis is hard is that we're, we still don't, I, I don't feel like I understand the industry. Um, not, and I don't understand necessarily um, the different user profiles that they're trying to attract. So it, to me, what I'd say is um, it's, it's hard to see a clear analogy between the tobacco industry and the cannabis, but it may be that I just haven't studied it closely enough. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So many people are able to relate to uh, this topic from a generational standpoint. Um, <clears throat> but let's fast forward to today because you did mention vaping and, and e-cigarettes. How do you think the marketing of, of smoking, specifically vaping, has impacted the black and brown community, specifically teens in suburban as well as urban areas? Yeah. So, so here's, this is another question that um, I would say I, I, I'm still trying to develop an understanding of. Because the vaping question cuts in two totally different directions. The industry has like a positive, the vaping industry has a positive story to tell. And some public health people buy it. And that is that for people who are trying to quit smoking, for like menthol smokers, that vaping or a nicotine patch or Nicorette gum can be smoking cessation devices, right? And it's actually healthier to come off of smoking cigarettes, which is tobacco products in your body, to segueing to smoking, uh, vaping, which is just nicotine. So you're basically cutting out the bad, you know, cancer causing stuff and you're using it as a step down. So one argument for vaping is if that was all that vaping was, then you would have public health people and doctors and, you know, public health advocates saying, yay, vaping, <laughs> right? Vaping is good because it's a segue to, but what the industry does is like Juul is that they've said, yeah, that's what we are doing, but they're actually engaging in the same tactics that the industry, the tobacco industry has done since the very beginning, which is they say, we're not trying to attract kids. We're not going after young smokers. We're not trying to make people long-term users of this product, right? But in fact, that's what's going on. Now, what I don't know is an answer to your specific question, right? Which is how do they study the demographics? Are they doing the same kind of racial targeting? My guess is that at least early on, it was not specific to, it's, it, they're really going after the youth market in the same way that the menthol makers went after the youth market in the 1950s. That's my sense. Now, here's the, uh, the last thing I'll say is that I think that the reasons why the FDA is unlikely to ban vaping is because they still hope that it will serve that first function that is a step down for people who want to quit smoking. And if they end up banning the menthol cigarette, then they can always say, well, look, we're banning menthols, but there's a path that people who can't get their menthol cigarettes can now take. And that path goes through, it's either quit, right? And rather than going into bootlegging or, or sort of black market stuff, there's a path you could take. And the path is through uh, 
flavored vaping as a step down. So, so there's a kind of a complicated story about vaping, which is that, you know, it, it has one good feature to it as a smoking cessation device, but mostly it's not that. <laughs> and I think the industry, nobody now trusts the industry. And the reason why people don't trust the industry is because the tobacco industry, once they saw flavored vaping take off, they partnered with the vaping industry and they bought <laughs> vaping products. So the vaping industry and the tobacco industry are like very close together. Um, yet again, a good example of, you know, what's going on in, in big tobacco. Thank you, thank you. Um, before I, I ask one last question, uh, I do want to let everybody know that we have a copy of Pushing Cool at the library. Um, Trustee Jones has her own personal copy, but you all can support public libraries. <laughs> and uh, you can come and pick that up. And we want to uh, give a special thanks to our local bookstore over in Maplewood, Words Bookstore, uh, for having the book available as well. So you can purchase it and um, share it with others as you see fit. Um, <clears throat> so one last question before we, we wrap up this evening. The football question um, is, is interesting for a, a number of reasons, but one of our attendees uh, makes note that uh, football is unhealthy and it disproportionately attracts black men who are the majority of the players. Um, the halftime show is interesting in, in that respect. Here's the question. Would you say that the performers are similar marketers, marketers or enablers? Marketers and enablers, uh, I guess it depends of what, right? I mean, they're definitely marketers, right? Um, I, I don't... Uh, I guess in the sense that since football is, is, is predominant... Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Marketers or enablers Black of, players, of... Yeah, yeah. Supporters as well. Are they enabling this to continue? Yeah. So, uh, I, well, the answer is yes. Um, here, But here's my take on, on football. I mean, to me, football is in the same kind of position where, you know, um, head injury, um, kind of long-term negative impact of playing football, extraordinary. Same kind of thing. It takes years for those damages to manifest themselves. Um, same kind of thing with smoking, disproportionately impacting, you know, black men, but also a form of like temporary um, sort of economic gain, right? For uh, young athletes who see this as a path out of, a path up in society, who themselves are making this decision about short-term gain, maybe long-term gain, but, but longer-term health deficits. And what the industry, the, tobacco, the, the, the NFL is trying to do is to figure out, okay, how can we keep this and make it safer? And this is what the industry, the tobacco industry spent years and years and years convincing people they were doing. We were gonna give you a safer version of this thing that everybody says is dangerous. And that's what menthol was. Menthol, with the, for the industry was like, and filtered cigarettes was like, let's sell people on the safe version. And now we're at the point now where we're like, even the safe version is, is horrible. It was never safer and it was just a deceit. So I guess I would leave you, uh, you know, the, the football question with a question, which is, is it possible to make football truly safe uh, through a wide range of, I mean, are we getting up with, you know, all kinds of modifications or is it just a charade, you know, that, that effectively all of this is enabling a bad sport to damage uh, a generation of players who are gonna end up in the long run 
dealing with the consequences. So to me, that's, a, that's an open question that I'll throw back to you all um, to think about because I haven't studied it closely, but I think there's a good analogy between what I'm describing with menthols and what you're seeing in football right now. Well then. And I, I, should, I, sh I should end by saying, it's great to see everyone, including all the Waylus <laughs> who have showed up <laughs> and they're all over the world. So <laughs> thanks for coming. Well, um, I, I think I think you leaving us with a question it is only appropriate for for people to leave them wondering and and wondering how much of this conversation will continue because, like I said before, I don't think anybody has had this conversation. You know, we just look at smoking cigarettes like anything else, mm -hmm. but not not trying, not attempting to focus on the, 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 the dis, dis, disproportionate use of, of, of smoking cigarettes and, and how it's marketed specifically to our Black community or how it has been at least. Um, <clears throat> I think I have one other question here in the chat. Let me see. It was just a thank you. <laughs> and on that note, um, I do want to thank you, uh, Dr. Wailu. Uh, and the whole wide tribe <laughs> for coming through this evening and, and many people who were able to chime in this evening uh, in celebrating uh, Black History Month with the Public Library as well as the Village of South Orange. Uh, Trustee Jones, thank you so much for co-moderating. Yeah, this was really thank great. You. Thank you so much. And um, thank you again, Dr. Wailu, for joining us. This has been Thanks. a really interesting conversation. I think we will definitely um, find ways to continue having the conversation. Thanks, I look forward to it. And I look forward to visiting the library next time I'm up in Maplewood, South Orange. Yes, we look forward to having you. So everyone, thank you for your questions and for, for joining us this evening. Uh, please be well and stay well and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.